Hey guys, this is Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us on the Thrive Bites podcast. This is season four, and we're so excited for you to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Colin Zhu, double boarded in family and lifestyle medicine, and I interview the best and most passionate health and wellness experts of the industry on this platform. And we talk about plant powered living, emotional resilience, and creating a thriving mindset. And this season, we're taking it live, we're taking it on multiple platforms, and we're taking it as a Q&A discussion as well as our interviewing of our guests. So we're super stoked about this, and please remember to like and subscribe down below, and we will see you. Welcome to the next episode. Hello, welcome to the Thrive Bites uh, podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us. You can be anywhere in the world, and you decided to join and spend a few moments with me and my guests here today. So I'm super stoked. Thank you for joining on. Uh, today's episode is uh, awesome. I have an amazing, amazing guest, and I'm going to introduce you to um, all you guys. His name is Dr. Robert Davis. Um, he is a PhD, also known as the Healthy Skeptic, and he is an award-winning health journalist whose work has appeared on CNN, PBS, WebMD, and the Wall Street Journal. The author of three previous books on health, he hosts the Healthy Skeptic video series, which uh, he dissects the science behind popular health claims. Dr. Davis holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree in public health from Emory University's uh, Rollins Colin of Oh, Rollins School of Public Health and a PhD in health policy from Brandeis University, where he has a Pew Foundation Fellow. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Robert Davis. Hey! <laughs> hey, Dr. Colin. How are you? I'm doing well, my friend. Thank you so, so much for being here and uh, taking the time out to share not only your expertise, but your wisdom, but also your experiences. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be with you. Where are you calling from? I am calling from the city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're actually Where it's always sunny. It. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, thank you so much. Uh, this is, um, you know, a great, great subject. Uh, we are, you know, the title of the episode is Debunking Common Myths. Uh, half truths, you know, you like to call it, which is, you know, such a great, uh, great word to describe it. And all these different health claims regarding around, you know, weight loss, right? And, um, you know, this is, I guess, you know, in, in during this during this time where we're in the pandemic, you know, we're in quarantine, we're sequestered, I'm sure you've seen people, you know, just being indoors, cooking for themselves, or maybe even, uh, you know, ordering in uh, delivery, fast food. So you have the opportunity to take back your health, but you also have the opportunity to go in the opposite direction. So, um, so I find that very, very interesting. And we definitely talk a lot about food and nutrition here. Um, but this is hyper focused in terms of weight loss and all the different things around it. So for to start off, um, to introduce you to our audience, uh, why don't we talk about, you know, your origin story of how you got from point A to point B and, you know, what got you into this? Well, uh, as you mentioned in my uh, introduction, I have a long history as a health journalist. I've spent many years as a health journalist. I also have a personal passion when it comes to health and wellness. So I'm, I'm an, a big, uh, an avid exerciser. I try to watch what I eat. I, I'm, I'm very, uh, it's, personal health is very important to me personally. So it's important for me to convey that through my work to help other people uh, who are interested in living healthier lifestyles. But we also know there's so much misinformation, right? There's so much misinformation about what you should do when it comes to diet and other wellness activities. And this has really come to the fore, certainly uh, in recent months with regard to COVID, because just there's been a lot of discussion around all the misinformation, but it's not, it's not restricted to COVID. We know that uh, it, it, re it relates to all kinds of aspects of health and wellness. So what I try to do in my work is to draw on my experience in public health and epidemiology and look at the studies, look at the research, look at the science to help readers and viewers figure out what's believable and what's not, to separate fact from fiction and to be able to make better decisions for themselves. I'm not here to tell people what to do. I'm not here to tell you what you should, what diet you should follow or what 
uh, what, what medicines you should take or anything else. But my goal is to help lead you to information that's believable and accurate so you can make better decisions for yourself. And that's what I've tried to do in this latest book that I've written all about uh, weight loss, because we all know th there's hardly any uh, subject I can think of where there's more misinformation and confusing information than weight loss. Um, yeah, so I definitely agree with you. There's uh, a lot of misinformation. You can probably see, you know, mountain ranges of them <laughs> just stockpiling up. Um, and uh, my question is to you, let's go, let's go a little bit deeper for yourself, you know, before we go into the quote unquote meat into it. Was there any like personal, um, I guess, uh, obstacles and challenges that you had to go through? Um, I know you are, you know, a, a PhD, so I don't, I don't think you see any uh, patients clinically. Um, but I guess my question is, have you had, you know, problems with weight, um, you know, yourselves or family members to kind of add to that spark to, you know, your current research? Yeah, in fact, as a kid, I was overweight as a kid. And I, I, I remember hearing people use words to describe me husky and full seated and spare tire and things that they thought were euphemistic. But I, as a kid, I internalized that. And so as I got older, I grew. And so I was, I sort of thinned out as I grew, but I always thought of myself, even when I wasn't overweight as an overweight person and an overweight kid because of that experience as a child. And, and, and I was, and I'm able to see from that it had just a small slice of what it is that people go through emotionally and psychologically when they're dealing with fighting, uh, weight throughout their lives. And certainly I know close friends and family members that have battled their weight and struggled with this throughout their lives. And so I, I've, I've, I do have a lot of insight, I think. I certainly I can't understand firsthand because I can't be in their shoes, but I know having spent many hours talking to them about it and, and, and talking about their struggles and having some understanding uh, of what they went through. So that certainly uh, helped, um, I think, inform a lot of the work that I've done, not only in this book, but my work generally as a journalist. Yeah, yeah. And as well as you know, like the media and, you know, just magazine counters. And, you know, now we have, you know, we're in the age of social media, information age, the internet, you know, things are just bombarded, you know, uh, at us constantly, you know, and, um, you know, and, and in terms of the female, uh, you know, female psyche, I'm sure it's, uh, you know, really, really detrimental. Um, you know, from the men, I think, you know, it would be an interesting take to kind of see, you know, what you have, uh, you know, what men kind of go through, you know, um, you know, I don't know if you've, you know, you know, maybe looked into like social trends or anything like that, but I know for as a guy, you know, um, you know, we always have to think that we have to look a certain way in terms of, you know, all these muscles up front, up top, and, you know, being in Los Angeles myself as well, you know, you look when you go on the beach and you look at these, you know, guys that are just like so top heavy and their legs are just like, you know, chicken legs. You're like, oh, my God, what's going on? <laughs> you know, so we have um, kind of like a distorted view, even as a male of how one, you know, needs to look. I mean, what do you think? No, absolutely. And in the book, I actually have a chapter all about this called Unreal Ideal. And I talk about the the, the female ideal of what a female body is quote, supposed to look like be, through the images we see in media and social media and so forth. But it's also true for men. I mean, men are affected in a different way. But as you say, men see a certain image and that affects their own self image, their body image as well. And so I talk about some of the research uh, pertaining uh, to men as well as women and how this affects their perception, perception of themselves and their uh, their satisfaction or lack thereof when it comes to their own weight and, and the way their mm -hmm. bodies look. Right, right. Because it's always like a bar that you always have to aim, you know, aim for or you're comparing yourself to. So um, so it's always it seems like it almost seems like a you know, never ending journey, you know, of sorts. And, you know, um, I think, you know, uh, if you can enlighten us, you know, what kind of strategies. But before we go into that, let's start off, you know, basic. Right. So in terms of you know, the mountain ranges of, you know, just weight loss and, you know, the, you know, uh, the misinformation of it, you know, I think in terms of the internet age and the social media, it invites a lot of, uh, I guess, health experts, right, um, to be able to kind of stand on a certain platform and to claim that they either have a quick fix or, you know, a new diet or, you know, a different way of dropping weight, right? So right. why do you think, why do you think there's so much in terms of misinformation? Like what is the motivation 
um, you know, for all this, you think? Well, a big one, certainly, and this will come as no surprise, it's maybe fairly obvious, is money, right? I mean, the weight loss industry is estimated to be worth more than $60 billion annually. And a number of players in that industry um, stand to benefit from disseminating misinformation. So whether we're talking about food manufacturers who have certain, quote, you know, diet friendly foods or um, people that are selling dietary supplements or people that are pushing diet plans or even gyms that are saying, come sign up and lose 30 pounds in 30 days. The list goes on. But there are a number of players in this industry that that profit from continuing to perpetuate these ideas that are not only misleading, but also harmful. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, I also think, and I talk about this in the book, biases, certain biases that we all have, whether lay people or uh, health professionals have certain biases. And just to give an example, um, you know, there's something called the bandwagon effect. And that's the idea that if a bunch of people believe something, we're more likely to believe it as well. And sort of another name for it might be groupthink. And so you see this with certain trends that emerge, you know, you name it, whatever it is, fasting or keto diet or whatever it is. People are like, oh, well, everyone else seems to be uh, doing this diet and it seems to work for them. So I'll believe this works and I'll jump on this bandwagon as well. And so, again, we see this not only among lay people, but also professionals. And then a related phenomenon to that is, is what's sometimes called the allegiance bias. And then we see a lot of this on social media and other places is where pe people will glom onto a certain belief system, whether it's based in science or not, and stick to that no matter what. So I like to say in weight there, it's a religion to many people and there are a bunch of denominations, right? So are you in the <laughs> keto denomination? Are, are you in the fasting denomination? Are you in the detox diet denomination? The list goes on and on and on. And people join these churches, these denominations, and they have a belief system and they stick with it no matter what the evidence says, no matter how much evidence to the contrary or lack of evidence there is, and say that, by God, this is the only way, the best way to deal with my weight and my health. And, um, and social media, you mentioned social media, tend to exacerbate that because people get in echo chambers. And so they hear other like-minded people around them who reinforce these ideas. And so they, they stick to them even more. And so these ideas take on a life of their own and, and get embedded. And it's really hard to dissuade people who have sort of dug in about some of these allegiances they have, allegiances they have. So um, that's, I think, another factor that we see that's always existed, but I think it's made worse by social media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I mean, you know, denominations is a great, you know, word or just, you know, just just having people, it's almost like a, man, I mean, I hate this, I hate to use this word, but like, it's almost like a religion, you know, it's like you have a certain way of thinking, you kind of corral, you know, other people to, you know, uh, I guess, reinforce your own belief systems. And then, you know, the more, the more, the merrier, but just in this case, like, you know, the more, the merrier, but, you know, those belief systems um, may not be as healthy for, you know, for you. So, you know, for example, like I, you know, I see patients clinically and, you know, I, you know, I, you know, we run the gamut of, you know, patients who are true, you know, carnivores to extreme vegans and I do family medicine and I see everyone in between. And I tell people, Hey, you know, I just meet them where they're at. And I look at the science, I look at the evidence and, you know, I meet them where they're at and I try my best to inform them. And I think that by informing them as much as I can, then they can make their you know, ch own choices. And that's what empowering others, you know, is to do. And I, and I see that, um, you know, you are doing that, you know, as well. So, um, so definitely, you know, I appreciate it. Um, my next question is, is that, um, you know, in, you know, what, you know, what you've said so far, um, you know, in your book, you say that counting calories has been, you know, overrated for, you know, losing weight, right? And my question is, you know, when someone, you know, when, when you hear about that, you know, for someone that actually does, you know, they're a really, really number, they're like a numbers oriented person, you know, why is that, you know, why is it overrated? And, you know, does it not matter in the whole grand scheme of things when you're trying to assess how you're doing? Well, what I say to that is that calories do count. So I'm not one, some people will say calories don't matter at all. And I'm not one of those people because I think the evidence is that energy intake and energy balance matters. But at the same time, counting calories is very difficult. 
and often fails for many people. And that's to say, that's not to say it never works. Certainly, as you say, there's certain people and it works fine for them and that's great. And if it works for people, they should keep doing it. But for many people, they try very hard to count calories because that's what they're told to do. And they find that over time, it doesn't work. And they find the experience very frustrating. And so, uh, you know, there are a number of reasons for this. The first is that doing it precisely is very difficult to do. I mean, think about, we know the calories on certain foods, for example, packaged foods, or if you go to a restaurant, but there's no guarantee that those calories are really accurate because they can be off. And under law, the, the calorie counts on food packages can be up to 20% off. And so right there, there's room for error. And certainly there are many foods we eat, which we don't have calorie counts for. And then also it's very hard to know how many calories you actually need to, that, that you should be getting in order to have a negative energy balance. So getting that math right is very, very, to getting it right is very, very difficult to do. But, but there's other whole other set of problems, and that is that calories are not the only issue when it comes to weight management. It's far more complicated than how many calories we consume, right? I mean, so, you know, there are a number of other factors to play a role. Certainly genetics plays a role. We all know people that can eat whatever they want, and they never seem to gain weight. And other people eat almost nothing, and they gain a lot of weight. So certainly that's <laughs> something that plays don't, a role. Don't like those people. <laughs> right. Yeah, those people, Exactly. Um, and, and, and science, for example, is emerging to give you another example of how our, our gut bacteria, our so-called microbiome may play a role in how many of the calories that we consume that are actually absorbed. And that may vary from person to person based on the mix of microbes in your gut. Now that's, that science is still emerging and there's a lot more work to be done, but it's an interesting line of research that suggests another variable that may be important. And then certainly there's just how our metabolisms work. As we cut calories, as we lose weight, our bodies fight us. Our metabolism slows down and essentially makes our bodies more fuel efficient so that as we consume the same number of calories, uh, those cal it's, you, you have to keep consuming fewer and fewer calories in order to keep losing weight because our bodies are using fewer calories. It's, it's a gift we have from evolution to keep us alive in times of famine and scarcity. But fortunately, the environment we live in today, we don't, for the most part, face that but it makes yeah. it very difficult for us to, to, to lose weight. And so that's something else that has to be taken into account beyond just how many calories we consume. Yeah, yeah, and, and I agree with you. I mean, I think, um, you know, just the human body, you know, even in the pandemic, we're learning more and more about, you know, how, you know, just how complex, you know, our physical bodies are. And, you know, there's just so much more that we need to understand. And it's not a singular component, you know, Sciences, you know, we have to, you know, study things, you know, uh, you know, in singular components, but the body is such a complex organism. And so, um, and there's a lot of interactions, right? So not only do you have the body, you know, you have, like you said, the metabolisms, we talk about, you know, hormones, there's a whole bunch of hormones that, you know, interact, you know, with our, you know, glands um, and other systems. And, um, you know, you have the environment, you know, you have the environment, uh, whether you smoke, drink, how well your sleep, um, you know, uh, you know, affects, you know, our metabolism, our weight management, it's just humongous. So I definitely, you know, uh, concur with what you're saying. And it's not a one size fit all, <laughs> uh, you know, no pun intended, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a lot more to consider. So uh, so switching up uh, a little bit, you know, talking about diets, right? And, um, you know, fat diet, yo-yo diets, you know, diets have been, you know, historically been in the, you know, popular media for some time, um, you know, and, and you touch upon this, you know, a lot in the book. Is there, in your opinion, you know, kind of like a quote unquote, you know, best diet, you know, um, there is a U.S. news report, I think like every season or I don't know, twice a year right. or every, every, January. They always, every January. Yeah. yeah. They always yeah. have like a list, right. A running list. What is, you know, what have you gathered, you know, through your research, you know, in terms of how that addresses weight loss? Well, looking at the evidence, uh, what I have seen is that, and there've been a number of studies that do head to head comparisons of different diets, you know, comparing a, a low carb diet to a low fat diet to other kinds of diets. And what study after study after study has shown is that over the long term, meaning 12 months or longer, which is what matters, um, no diet comes out on top with regard to weight loss. So that all diets are about the same. And we see this repeatedly in the head-to-head -head studies. Now, some diets, for example, a low-carb diet may have some advantages short term over, say, six months. But again, those sort of go away when you get to 12 months or, uh, or longer. 
Um, and so I, I, I think I have an objection even to the word diet when it comes yeah. to weight loss, because what does a diet imply? A diet implies it's something you're going to go on short term. You're going to eat a certain way, follow certain rules for a few months or what, how, however long. And then once you've reached your target, you stop doing it. And therein lies the problem, because all of these, most of these are uh, diets, are plans that are not sustainable over the long term because they involve restriction. They involve a lot of rules and they just involve ways of eating that most people cannot sustain over the long term. And so therein lies a big problem with them. And so they may work short term and they may, may be fine as sort of a way to sort of kickstart what you want to do, but they're not a solution to weight management. And so what, what, and there are a lot of names for what I think is the best way to eat. And again, I don't like to call it a diet. I like to call it a, a, an eating pattern. But that's what would be known as a whole foods eating pattern, meaning uh, mm -hmm. eating plenty of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, beans, seeds, lean meats, fish, dairy, if you include dairy, eggs, and trying to minimize highly processed foods, things like sweets and soda and fries uh, and, and white bread and things like that. Now, that, that doesn't mean you never eat those. It doesn't mean they're completely off limits and poison and you should never touch them the way that certain diets tell you you have a list of foods never to eat. It just means that you want to gradually over time eat less of these foods. And if you want to enjoy them, sometimes that's fine, but just make them occasional treats and try to eat them in, in limited portions. But try to focus mainly on these other foods. And that kind of diet research shows is not only the best diet for your overall health, but also one that's best for uh weight regulation over time. Uh, and so the gr good thing about that kind of eating is that it doesn't uh, require strict rules. There's a lot of flexibility where you can tailor it to what you like and you don't have to include foods that you don't like. And But but it, I think that research shows again and again that that's the best way of eating. And so typically when you see these ratings from US News, it's it comes under different names. It's sometimes the flexitarian diet or the Mediterranean diet. They're very similar, though, in that those are sort of the basic principles of that kind of eat, that that way of eating. Yeah, it's, um, you know, for for here, we kind of, you know, we t kind of teach from a whole foods plant based approach. And uh, we definitely emphasize, you know, plants a lot. And uh, but I agree with you. It's um, I teach my patients in terms of, you know, eat how mother nature intended, you know, for us to eat, right? Um, and I tell them if it didn't grow out of a, you know, vine, a tree or out of the ground, you know, you want to minimize it. Um, I educate a lot about, you know, how a supermarket works, because if you don't know how the supermarket works, you, it's kind of like a trap if you think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. And, um, you know, it's, um, but, you know, whole foods, you know, like you said, and, um, and I think that the food industry, you know, and what we've created is, you know, what what I've heard is called food related products. And, and as you know, it's very processed, it's very refined, there's a bunch of preservatives, chemicals, binders, and it's just doesn't, it's not representative of food anymore. So um, over time, that's what's, you know, been contributing, you know, um, to our chronic disease burden. So, you know, here, we're talking about weight loss, you know, with our, um, you know, with my patients, you know, I tell them like, yes, weight loss is important. But, you know, what are your overall health goals, Mr. Smith? You know, what do you want to achieve? You know, so um, I think um, weight loss is to me is like it's too singular of a parameter, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I, I like to kind of optimize, you know, someone's health and well-being. So definitely, definitely uh, food for thought. So <laughs> what about yourself? Are you do you do you prepare food for yourself? Do you cook in this manner as well? I do. I, I really try to. And I'm not a great cook, but I don't think you need to be a gourmet chef or a great cook in order to eat that way. I know you don't. And so I make simple foods for myself, but I eat a lot of vegetables and I eat uh, chicken breasts and I eat uh, beans and nuts and all these foods. And I incorporate them into uh, and I try to in all my meals and whole grains. And uh, and I enjoy, you know, I grew up as a kid who ate all the junk food. You know, I ate the pop tarts and the donuts and the soda and I grew up eating all that stuff. And so it's when I got to college that I started changing my eating habits and it was gradual. You, it's, it's impossible to ask them to change their eating habits that have they followed over a lifetime overnight. That can't be, happen. And, and that, again, that's a problem with diets often is they expect them yeah. to change immediately. So people have to be patient. But I was able over time to change my eating habits over time and change my taste buds. And so, yes, do I still enjoy ice cream? Of course. And do I enjoy chocolate? Do I enjoy uh, French fries sometimes. Yes. But overall, but the, those are, those are treats that I have occasionally 
whereas they used to be staples and they're things I eat occasionally now, but I've been able to do that over time and, and, and learn to eat a new way. And I don't feel deprived. I don't feel that I'm missing out. I don't feel that I'm sacrificing anything because there are lots of foods that fall in those categories that I'd love to eat. And I, and I know that if I can do it, anybody else can do it because, you know, as I say, my diet was <laughs> terrible growing up. Yeah, definitely. And um, I personally don't say this a lot, but like growing up, um, you know, we we lived off of like Pizza Hut and McDonald's and, you know, all the good stuff. I'm a, I, I'm a huge pizza lover, you know, so I used to drink for me, I used to drink like three glasses of milk. Um, and um, I and for me, for me, you, uh, personally, you know, it just, you know, really I had bad acne, you know, for many, many years and had a lot of bloating sensations. So for me, I had to discard, I had to kind of get rid of it. But it's, um, it also teaches you when you shift in this kind of way, when you're actually eating more whole foods, I find that it gives uh, people an opportunity to, you know, really listen to their own bodies. You know, you were talking about how, you know, I've been able to shift and I've been to able to adjust. And it seems like you have a more of like, you know, intuitive sense of, you know, what your body can tolerate and what you can't. And um, I find this with my patients where, you know, if they've been living off of more, um, you know, the standard American diet where it's just more refined and processed, you know, it's uh, your body cues are not as strong. I find it, you know, um, you know, that's just from my observations with my uh, patients. And, um, you know, when you're shifting, you're able to say like, wow, I'm more sensitive to, you know, just crap, you know, when I eat it from time to time. So I don't know if you, you feel that from time to time. No, absolutely. And, and I've certainly found that to be the case with me. And, and I think part of that is, and we could spend a whole nother hour talking about this, is the way those <laughs> foods are designed to make, make us uh, enjoy them that way, to make us consume yeah. them quickly and to crave them more. And because that's, that's, that's inherent in the way that they're designed. And, yeah. uh, and, and so that's why that bag of chips tastes really good and we want to keep eating them. But it, it also, as you say, cuts us off from really being able to feel how our body's responding. Yeah, exactly. I mean, these, I mean, you think, if you think about it, these food companies have, you know, deep pockets and they'll hire the best, you know, food scientists and chemists to chemically manipulate, you know, our taste buds because they know that our taste buds um, and our palate can be. So, um, but I think arming ourselves with the right information, you know, we have the ability to kind of decide, you know, what goes in and out. So, um, shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, you talk about, uh, I know you've written a book previously about exercise, um, but in this sense, um, you know, you also say that it's, it may not be as, uh, I guess, important um, in terms of, you know, uh, weight loss. And, you know, for me, you know, that kind of seems, you know, surprising um, because, you know, we are, we're, we're made to think that, you know, you exercise depending on whether you're doing cardiovascularly or resistance or tr uh, strength training, you know, you're essentially burning calories, right? So what is your take in the role of exercise with weight loss? Well, first of all, you're right. I, I have written a book about exercise. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a huge proponent of exercise. So let me say everybody should exercise for your health. It's very, it's arguably the most important thing you can do to maintain good health in so many different ways. So but, but it, and it has so many benefits. But one of the benefits that it does not have, at least according to research typically, is helping people lose weight. And that's ironic because that's often the reason people will say what, the number one reason they exercise is to lose weight. So we're expecting it to do something. It can do all these amazing things for us. But the one thing that off, people often expect it to do most is one thing it's not so good at doing. And the reason is that um, the typical kind of exercise that most of us do, whether it's going for a brisk walk or going for a bike ride or taking a yoga class, doesn't burn that many calories. So it's, it burns surprisingly low number of calories. And it's much easier to simply cut out a soda or a cookie or something else to save those calories rather than taking a brisk walk for 30 or 40 minutes. So, so that's one problem. But even when people exercise vigorously, we're talking in order to really dent, put a dent in your weight, say burning 500 calories five or six days a week, that's, that's a lot of exercise. That's vigorous exercise or prolonged exercise. When people are, even when people are able to do that, again, we talked earlier about how the body responds. The body compensates in certain ways to fight you. So appetite will increase often once when people are exercising very vigorously, that'll counter what's happening. So they'll end up eating more. Uh, the, your metabolism slows then just as when you, and this is surprising to people, just as when you cut calories and lose weight, um, if you exercise and lose weight, if you're exercising very vigorously, your metabolism will slow too. 
And so that is another way that the body, it, it will make it harder for you to continue losing weight with exercise. So, so that, those are the negative things, but I should also say there's some positive things. So there's some research that shows, and actually a good amount of research, that shows that while exercise may not help you lose weight, it can be very important in helping you maintain weight loss. And that's where exercise is mm. crucial when it comes to weight. So that it, to keeping weight off that you've lost or preventing weight gain, there's a lot of evidence that exercise, and we're talking not super vigorous, but just moderate exercise, the kind that's recommended for cardiovascular health, five days of the week, 30 minutes a day total, that can be very effective for helping to um, prevent weight gain. So, so that's where exercise can actually be quite beneficial. Um, so again, I think it's important for people to exercise, but they should go in with the right expectations. And if they do that, then they won't come out disappointed and give up on exercise. They say, well, I, I went into it. I'm not losing weight, so I'm going to stop exercising. Because that's, that's the worst outcome of all. And, and I know that happens mm. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Because I, last time, um, you know, when, when, I, when I did my studies, like way back when, when I researched, uh, because I've been very athletic you know, um, in my younger years, and I run and, um, you know, do uh, just basically running races now, um, you know, my understanding is that, you know, when you do more resistance uh, training, strength training, you know, you're building up, you know, more mu uh, muscles, essentially. And, you know, my understanding is that the body, you know, when it holds on to more muscle, um, you would actually increase in, you know, metabolism, um, and actually essentially burn calories. So does the research, you know, find that it's, you know, not so much or, you know, um, like, what, what, what have you uh, found in terms of like, building muscle per se, because the right. exercise that you cited was more, I guess, lower impact, I guess, wrist walking, yoga, um, you know, bike ride, they're, they're more like cardiovascular type of exercises. What about in terms of like strength, uh, strength training? Well, the research shows that strength training, uh, both strength training and cardio can be effective to help uh, maintain weight loss. And if you do a lot of both to help promote weight loss, but your point is a good one when it comes to actually the, the role of muscle and building muscle and that obviously we know that, uh, you know, muscle burns more fat, burns more calories than mm -hmm. fat does. But I mean, I think the key there is for the average person, the amount of muscle they're going to put on by lifting weights is not large enough to make a huge dent. At least that's what the research has shown. Now, obviously we're all different. Mm. Genetically, we're different in terms of how much muscle we're going to put on if we go to the gym and lift weights. Some people may put on a lot of weight, a lot of muscle. Some people may less, depends on genetics, age, a lot of things. But for the average person, they probably are not going to increase their muscle mass significantly enough to have a huge impact on calorie burning. But, but again, mm. Uh, there are plenty of benefits and, and, and it's important to incorporate weight training, very important to incorporate yeah. weight training just to preserve muscle mass because we lose muscle mass as we get older. So that's a key part of any kind of exercise program to incorporate that. Oh yeah, for sure. And, um, uh, it doesn't sound like you're trying to discourage. It's just saying that the research is saying like, Hey, it may not be like, you know, the first thing you're thinking of, like when you're saying that everyone, you know, starts off their New Year's resolutions at a gym, you know, the whole goal is to lose weight, weight, right? But it's, uh, you know, research is saying it's, you know, more, you know, maintaining, you know, the weight loss that you've already had. So um, because it is important because you're exercising your heart, um, you're maintaining, you know, musculature. And as we age, you know, we have to be able to, you know, have good uh, balance and agility and just be able to, you know, just falls in general. There's a lot of complications from just falls from our elderly population. And like you said, we have a lot of muscle atrophy as we, um, you know, and, you know, volume atrophy as we like actually, you know, age. So it's super and super important. So what do you, uh, what do you personally, uh, uh, what's your mode of exercise for yourself? I do a combination. So I do, I'm a runner. So I run several days a week. I do some high intensity interval training. So sprints, I incorporate that. <laughs> I also go to the gym and lift weights a few days a week and do sort of boot camp things to, to sort of, uh, you know, get my heart rate up as well. So I kind of do a combination of things because again, I, I like to do that. And also my, uh, you know, review of the research suggests to me that a combination is good and it just keeps it interesting with a lot of different things. So it doesn't get boring. Of course. That's awesome. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then uh, when we come back, uh, we will close out and uh, answer any final questions. For those that are watching, if you have any questions and you want to ask Dr. Davis uh, live on this session, please type in your questions and uh, we'll ask them live. So, and we'll be right back.
Hey guys, this is Dr. Colin Zhu and welcome to Thrive Formula. I'm so excited for you to be here and to be just a little curious about what we do. If you know a little bit about my work, I created the Chef Doc in January 2017. And since launching it, I've written a book about thriving and hosting my podcast called Thrive Bites, where we've reached over 90 countries and counting. It's been a humbling and unexpected experience so far. The main driving force to create the Chef Doc was born out of the need to help others to combat chronic lifestyle related diseases such as high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, inactive physical lifestyle, and simply not being able to cook healthily. I noticed the same paucity and deficit within our medical school education and also within our medical training across the nation. 2020 for us, like the rest of the world, gave us a new set of challenges. Even with health disparities and racial injustice, I decided to look at things from a very silver lining perspective. And that meant, how do we become more resilient as a community? How do we pivot as a human species? Do I focus on me or us? With so many different people and different walks of life, I realized that we're more similar than dissimilar. And to cultivate a thriving mindset meant a lot of self-work, self-education, and practical tools, but also in conjunction with other people. I could not be where I am without the support and foundation of others. That means right now, more than ever, we need to be unified and we need to thrive together. Therefore, I decided to create this virtual summit experience gathering and collaborating with over 45 speakers from different parts of the health and wellness industry to inspire, educate, and teach you the tools to thrive, not just in your own life, but also to those around you. And we will do this through the five pillars, what I like to call my five to thrive. Food as medicine, functional fitness, relationships, community, and resilience. I'm beyond ecstatic for you to be here. And the only question I would ask is, do you dare to choose to thrive in your own life? If you do, then come on in, let's learn together, and I'll see you inside. Thank you very much. All right. So let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, now, uh, a lot of the popular, you know, media nowadays are, you know, promoting and, you know, really showcasing about fasting or restrictive uh, eating. And that's been evolving in the literature and popular media. And, uh, you know, take, for example, intermittent fasting. Um, in your opinion, you know, does it work with weight loss? And, you know, what have you found in the literature? What I well, first of all, anecdotally, we know, we all know, certainly I know people that swear by it, that say it works for them. And that's great. And I think as with anything, if it works for you, great, because we know that everybody's different. But if you look at the research, what it shows is that uh, intermittent fasting diets, and we know there are different ways of doing it. You know, you can do the 5-2 diet, or you can do every other day, or you can do restrictive time feeding, uh, so forth. But in general, um, uh, what it shows is that uh, intermittent fasting does result in weight loss. But, and here's the big but, uh, it's no greater weight loss than standard calorie cutting diets. So mm -hmm. it's not as though it's some kind of magic solution that's better than the usual approach. And there's one other caveat. There's some research that actually suggests that intermittent fasting results in greater muscle loss than a standard calorie cutting diet, which is for reasons we discussed earlier is a bad thing. You know, you want to lose fat, but you don't want to lose muscle when you're dieting mm -hmm. or when you're trying to lose weight for, because you want to preserve muscle. So that's a, that's a concerning thing about intermittent fasting. And then w the other thing is we just, we don't have studies over the long term to know how sustainable intermittent fasting diet is or whether it works over say a year or two years or longer. There's very little research on that. So, um, you know, I think again, it's an example of if people find that they can go for long periods of that eating. And I certainly can. And I know many people that couldn't do that. But if that works for you, that's fine. But I think it shouldn't. And too often, though, it's held up as some kind of magic solution that's better than anything else. And the, the, the research certainly doesn't show that to be the case. Yeah, I think like everything else, when you or with anyone, you know, that embarks on a new 
uh, I guess, chapter in terms of health and wellness, you know, to do it with, you know, someone, you know, at your side, you know, uh, whether it's a primary care physician or a specialist or a personal trainer, we've been talking a lot about exercise today, um, or a dietitian, you know, have someone in your corner, because, you know, like we talked about, you know, misinformation is literally like the, the ocean, you know, you and me were in LA, so it's the Pacific Ocean, and it could be very, very dark and very, very deep, and you could get lost in the deep end, right? Um, so it's it definitely yeah. important to have someone in your corner. And, uh, you know, I, I personally practice, you know, uh, intermittent fasting, um, I think it's great. Um, and I think it's, you know, definitely, you know, the way I think about it is, it's restricting the, you know, time frame that you're actually, you know, eating. So, um, you know, because if you take if you take the word breakfast, you know, what, 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 what are we doing, we're actually breaking fast. So, inherently we're all, we're actually you know fasting just not as long you know and um you know regimens uh, there's so many different kind of regimens like you said uh, but definitely it's super important to you know uh get all the basics down you know so um but yeah well, thank and, you for, for answering and, and if if i may just one thing to add to that um certainly there is good evidence and i assume i'm sure you could spend a long time talking about this longer is is to the benefits it may have outside of weight with regard to health so oh, yeah. fasting diets and oh, yeah. animals. So that's, I think it's a whole nother reason why some people engage in fasting diets because there's actually a lot of good evidence in it from animal studies that it can help those animals live longer and have experienced fewer uh, chronic diseases. And, uh, yeah. and so there, there could be a number of, of health benefits. Um, so I think that's a whole separate reason that some people might follow uh, and do follow fasting diets. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In regards to like, you know, uh, chronic inflammation, um, um, uh, autophagy, the person that, you know, I forget the guy's Japanese, he's a biochemist, he won a Nobel Prize for this. <laughs> it's his research with autophagy and, um, you know, and, and it's involved with uh, fasting. Uh, but it's kind of like spring cleaning, you know, for yourselves, you know, just, you know, basically decluttering, you know, when your body goes into like a fasting mode. But again, that's a whole separate another, you know, session, um, you know, so we can definitely talk about that. Um, so I definitely want to close out and, uh, you know, not uh, so with everything that we've gone through, you know, in terms of, you know, what you've looked at, you know, and you looked at, uh, you know, in terms of uh, literature, you looked at popular media, you look at the, you know, the evidence and stuff like that. Does it seem like kind of like an uphill battle, you know, um, that it's insurmountable that, you know, we can't get ourselves to a more stable weight, um, you know, in from the medical perspective, you know, we want people in a normal BMI, you know, instead of the overweight or obese categories, but we, you know, even though the body mass index, the BMI is not really the best accurate measure, you know, we also measure, you know, different things like height and weight and body, uh, body fat percentage and things like that. But, you know, just with all that, you know, do you feel like it's an uphill battle? You know, is this something that we can't really conquer at the end of the day? Because it doesn't seem like the media is ever going to stop talking about it, right? Or people are not going to make these so-called health claims or, you know, half truths. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the way that I like to think of it, it, it is certainly a difficult battle, but it's not an impossible battle. And, and I think that that's an important message for people to get is not to get discouraged because there are reasons, there are plenty of reasons people can and do to get discouraged. Obviously, there are so many people that try and fail and try and fail and try different diets and weight cycle, and they're up against, um, you know, all, all kinds of misinformation. They're up against psychology. They're up against biology. They're up against mm -hmm. um, people peddling all kinds of things to be promising that are going to work that don't. So that makes it difficult. But this is the way that I like to think of it. I think that if you can, uh, number one, get information that's science-based and accurate, the kind of information at least that I'm trying to lay out, apply that in a way that works for you, number one. And then number two, have ex the right expectations. So the right information, the right expectations. And the expectations are crucial because if you come in and believe some claim that you're going to lose you know, 50 pounds in 30 days, that's, that's very misleading. And then it doesn't happen, you blame yourself or that some, mm -hmm. some other outcome is going to occur and it doesn't happen and you blame yourself, that's a big problem. And so you need to go in with with realistic expectations about what can and can't be done, about not only how the weight's going to come off, how much is going to come off, but what's a realistic weight for you and what's a healthy weight for you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what what you weighed 30 or 40 years ago or your lowest weight in college may not be the healthiest or most realistic or best weight for you now. 
And so I think people also need to get to understand and, and get realistic expectations. And I think if they can match good information with realistic expectations, then this battle is certainly winnable. And there are plenty of examples of people that have won the battle. But I think those yeah. two components are essential. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's awesome. That that, that was actually beautiful because, uh, you know, it's uh, not only is arming yourself with the right education, information and tools, but, you know, it's like, what is what is right for you? Because at the end of the day, it's like weight loss is so much it's very mental and it's very psychological, which is something that we didn't really go deep, deep on. And uh, it's uh, it can be very detrimental. Mental health is already um, a huge uh, issue that the, the pandemic has, you know, brought to the surface, right? So when you add to that, you know, people just like stress eating, emotionally eating, and then they're constantly, you know, comparing themselves, like you said, to your previous self or another family member or a friend or a billboard, you know, it could be, you know, very, very dam uh, damaging. So um, I definitely would definitely add to saying like, you know, what is true for you? What is right for you? And, you know, it's, you know, what is healthy at the end of the day? I, I think um, you and I would both agree that, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about optimal health. And um, if weight loss, you know, fits in that picture, then, you know, then definitely, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a surefire thing. So um, Dr. Davis, thank you so, so much for being here with us on the show. Um, how do people find uh, you and where can they get your upcoming book? So they can find me at my website, healthyskeptic.com. And there I have information about myself and I have a bunch of videos I've produced on a lot of these topics that you can watch and invite you to watch. And the book, you can order the book from there or you can go onto Amazon. The book is available, will, will be available there uh, for order, but it's available for pre-order now. Uh, Super Size Lies is the title. <laughs> I definitely, uh, you know, definitely go and get it. So, you know, um, what is the date for the release? Uh, September 21st. Okay. This year. This year. Correct. All right. All right. Well, you guys heard it. Definitely uh, pre-order your copy and, you know, just to learn more. And uh, Dr. Davis has done an incredible amount of work, um, you know, putting into it so he could give he just literally spoon feed you the right information so uh dr david thank you so so much for being here with us on the show and uh you know definitely um you know big ups and kudos to your contributions um upcoming so we greatly appreciate it thank you dr colin it's been a great pleasure talking to you <laughs> guys thank you so much for watching this session please find us uh, here every week live um, um, on Thrive Bites, uh podcast at 5 p.m. Uh, every Wednesday and please say goodbye to Dr. Robert Davis <laughs> guys thank you so much for watching that episode we hope you enjoy it and please remember to like and subscribe down below so you can get continuous updates for future episodes and future guests and we can't wait for this upcoming season so don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you on the